Mercaris is the nation's leading market information service for organic and non-GMO agricultural commodities. At Mercaris.com, you can find up-to-date information on market conditions for organic and non-GMO commodities, including import and export, acreage and production estimates, and timely commodity pricing information. Visit Mercaris.com now for more information. Or, for agricultural producers, visit Mercaris.com slash farmer to sign up for Mercaris's free farmer plan. This is Ryan Corey, the Director of Economics here at Macaris, uh, bringing you your August update to the U.S. Organic Market Outlook. You know, talking about this point in August, one of the big stories that we've seen in terms of acreage and production has really been what's going on in Iowa. Uh, Iowa is a pretty substantial part of the U.S. organic picture. You know, they produce somewhere, or they contain somewhere around 10 to 11 percent of organic farm acres for uh, organic corn production at least. And with the drought setting in earlier this year and then the uh, massive derecho storm that came through around the midpoint of the, the month, uh, really what we've seen is two incidents that run a risk of cutting into that production outlook. And so what we tried to do earlier this month is take a look at, okay, where are those organic acres in Iowa located and how much are they exposed to these two major phenomena? You know, talking about the first one, the drought, it's a fairly substantial issue for the operations that are located in western Iowa, but the reality is there aren't the majority of organic acres in Iowa are not in the western part of the state. They're they're largely eastern and you know, northeastern and southeastern. We estimate that only about four percent of organic farms from that grow organic corn and organic soybeans in Iowa, only about four percent of those are actually located in the areas with the worst of the drought conditions. And so, by and large, we're not expecting to see much impact on organic corn production as a result of that. Now, the second issue, talking about the derecho storm front, there's a potential that we're going to see actually a much larger impact there just because of the fact that it kind of had a much wider swath of damage across the state particularly looking at the Keokuk and Washington County areas within Iowa. Uh, we estimate that between Iowa, Johnson, Keokuk, and Washington County, about 22% of Iowa's organic corn and soybean farms are located in that area. And that's right smack dab in the middle of the path that that storm took. And, and with that storm, you know, looking at crop conditions within the state, we've definitely seen some detriment. The uh, week ending, uh, August 16th, the crop condition within Iowa had plummeted down to 59% good to excellent. If you look at the week ending August 2nd, we were sitting at 73%. So we definitely know across the state we've seen a lot of damage to the crop, and we definitely know that we have some producers who are located right within that region. So looking at the overall picture, there definitely appears to be the risk to have some reduction in, you know, potentially harvested acres and yield as a result of that storm coming through. Now, Ryan, with that Iowa weather potentially impacting uh, the organic corn crop, we did talk last month about a few other regions that were dealing with some drought issues. Um, and I've also noticed that Pennsylvania and Ohio and a few other regions are dealing with some uh, onset of drought. How do you see that impacting the organic corn crop at this time? Yeah, you know, looking at Pennsylvania and, uh, and Ohio, they're they're both sitting lower than they were last year in terms of the percentage of crop rate of good to excellent. Pennsylvania specifically is looks like it's been hit pretty hard by the dry conditions uh, as of that week ending August 16th. The uh, USDA had Pennsylvania corn crop rate as 47% good to excellent, which is down from 73% at this point last, or the down from. 73% for the five-year average for this point uh, in the year. In Ohio, too, we're seeing you know that rating is lower, 47%, though not quite as far from the five-year average, 52% for the state. Uh, but both across those, you know, we see some of those drought conditions persist, even though some of our Midwestern states that are a little bit farther to the west, Illinois, Indiana, that we've talked about seeing some dry conditions there, they've been catching some 
you know, bouts of rain that have definitely helped ameliorate some of the issues we saw earlier. But the farther east you get into, like we were talking about Pennsylvania and Ohio, they're definitely looking like they're struggling. And the same kind of persists for Texas, too. Texas is also sitting at that 47% good to excellent rating, which if we look at where Texas was last year, we were sitting at about 54% good to excellent. So, again, you know, not quite as that dramatic as the drop as we're seeing in Pennsylvania, but really thinking about Texas as one of those areas that has kind of seen a fair amount of expansion recently in terms of organic production. And that part of the country being one of those areas that's experienced some growth in organic dairy production, uh, Losing production in Texas this year or restricted production in Texas this year could create that hole for demand that we talked about before. Yeah, looking at where organic livestock production set over the month of July, uh, looking at cage-free egg layer situation, we're sitting pretty steady with where we've been pretty much all year. Uh, over the month of July, the USDA put organic cage-free egg layer inventories at 15.8 million head, which is pretty flat with where we were the month before and pretty steady with where we were last year. In general, you know, organic egg production has just, it's, it's been steady to modestly higher this year, and July really just follows that trend. You know, one thing that we did talk about last month is what's going on with organic broiler slaughter. That was one of those major things that we saw following the uh, outbreak of COVID-19 and the slowdown in just livestock production in the U.S. Uh, in the organic sector, we saw that massive hit to broiler slaughter. And that hit to broiler slaughter was somewhat befuddling because we couldn't quite put our finger on the reason why it fell so dramatically. And then following that, we actually saw a pretty substantial climb back up. You know, before, if you're looking at January, February, and into March, U.S. organic broiler slaughter had been tracking just a little bit above where it was the prior year. And then over March and April and little into May, it dipped. But since then, you know, if we're talking about the month of July, we estimate organic broiler slaughter hit about 4.7 million head, which is up 12% year over year. And that kind of follows with uh, what we saw in June, where it hit about 4.66 million head. So this is one of those things that we're really watching, especially as we creep into this next marketing year. One of the things that had been reported early on is the potential impact of COVID-19 with the switch from consumer demand from restaurants to grocery stores is the possibility of increased consumer demand for organic goods. Uh, particularly for uh, meat and poultry and uh, and dairy products. And really what we've seen in terms of the pace of organic broiler slaughter seems to reflect that reality. It definitely looks like more birds are being pushed through the pipeline, and we're definitely seeing an increase in that production. And so how that translates back into animal feed demand and how that translates into demand growth as we look at the 2021 marketing year, you know, this is definitely a number – that's worth keeping your eye on and thinking about what that could mean for maybe adding some support to prices as we look at next year. So looking at U.S. organic imports, July saw a pretty big swing back on organic corn imports. Uh, we saw the organic corn imports over the month reach about 11.5 million, or 11.5 thousand metric tons, which is up about 300% year over year. You know, the reason that this is interesting is we had watched them kind of dwindle over May and June, and there was some speculation that, you know, with port closures going on, that maybe we were seeing the impact of COVID-19. But in reality, what that impact likely was is seasonality, with Argentina being our largest supplier of organic corn imports. And pretty well as expected, as we're starting to see Q3 uh, come in and we're starting to see the end of this marketing year, it's following the seasonal trend where they're picking up. And with that huge uptick in organic corn imports, it really is Argentina that we've seen come back online over that month. And, you know, with Argentina imports picking up so much this year, you know, currently we're on pace to see U.S. organic corn imports from Argentina end um, more than double than what we were last year's level of imports. But with that, overall, we're looking at about a 53% increase in U.S. organic corn imports by the end of this marketing year, if the pace that we saw so far persists through August, which puts us at our highest level of organic corn imports since we're looking at the 16-17 marketing year, so a pretty remarkable increase in organic corn imports. And the flip side of that corn, coin being what we've seen going on with organic crack corn imports. Over the past couple of years, you know, we saw those things drop off 
uh, we saw organic whole corn imports drop off, uh, being offset by a pretty substantial increase in cracked corn imports. And this year, we've seen that pendulum swing back. And part of that is that Black Sea import picture that we've been talking about for a few years now. Black Sea kind of continues to lose its preference within organic markets, and Turkey is by and far the largest supplier of organic cracked corn imports. Uh, I think that they've actually accounted for virtually all of our organic cracked corn imports since the start of this marketing year. And we just continue to see that area drop off. And so on net, really what we're talking about is an import picture for corn, you know, combining cracked corn and whole corn. Well, we're probably on pace to end this year about even to maybe modestly up with where we were last year in terms of overall imports. And so looking at soybeans over the month of July, it looks quite a bit like what we saw on corn. Uh, organic soybeans look like the end of the month of July up about 150% year over year. And a big part of that increase is we're starting to see a return in imports from Argentina. Again, kind of like what we saw with corn. They slowed down over that second quarter over the spring. And they're picking up now as we're getting into the third quarter and ending the month in June. Uh, the other thing that's been really remarkable with organic soybean imports this year, and frankly, uh, an issue that we we caught almost a little late, is what's happened with organic corn, or soybean imports from Russia. Uh, it's pretty phenomenal what we've seen. If you're looking at last year, the 1819 marketing year, you know you're looking at about 7.5 thousand metric tons of soybeans imported from Russia, you know, a fairly marginal factor in the overall picture in terms of total U.S. organic soybean imports. This year, Russia has actually uh, expanded phenomenally, and if they continue their pace through August, we'll likely see the U.S. import more than 100,000 metric tons, making them the second largest supplier of organic soybean imports to the U.S. throughout this marketing year, right behind Argentina. And so between the the, this boom that we're seeing in imports from Russia and Argentina continuing to just be a strong supplier to the U.S. You know, we're on track to see U.S. whole soybean imports uh, in the year higher year to year. You know, up somewhere around 15%. And if you look at the other half of that situation, what's going on with soybean meal imports? Something we had talked mm -hmm. about before mm -hmm. is the issues that we saw going on with imports from India. You know, with India being the largest supplier of organic soybean meal to the U.S., they were having some substantial port issues and export issues following the outbreak of COVID. And last month, we talked about how we're starting to see those things resolved. And once we had final July import numbers in, boy, do they look like they're resolved. Uh, we estimate that U.S. imports of soybean meal from India reached close to 30,000 metric tons over the month of July, which is up about 9% from where we were last year and nearly double what we imported over the month of June. Uh, and with that, you know, one of the things that we're watching is that ratchet up. Is that partially catch up or is that an indicator of what we're going to see over August? Either way, though, you know, it, it definitely it's, it means that we're, we're starting to see India answer back faster than what we had expected. We really didn't expect to see imports from that country take off until we got into August. And so that's, that's adding to that supply picture at the tail end of this market. Again. Now back to the Russia situation where uh, that's uh, that dramatic increase in imports coming from Russia. I assume that's coming through the Black Sea region. So two parts of uh, that qu question for you would be, uh, would do you see the trend uh, continuing of imports coming from Russia? And then the second question that you touched on earlier is with uh, that Black Sea region having some concerns over the integrity of the grain that is coming out of that area and its organic integrity. What is, I know the USDA has ratcheted up quite a bit on the oversight of imported grains, but uh, do you see uh, that impacting Russia imports as well? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting what we've seen going on with Russia because of that Black Sea thing that you're talking about. And what I find most fascinating about it is, you know, the first month that we really saw this dramatic increase in soybean imports from Russia was August of last year, which is interesting because over that month, the U.S. imported about 5,000 metric tons, which we imported 7,500 over the entire marketing year. So the vast majority of what we imported that whole marketing year came in August. And then that pace has just kind of kept up throughout this whole year. 
What I find interesting about that is if you rewind to May of last year and the, it was about that time that the NOP started revoking some organic certifications from some of the operations in the Black Sea region, uh, particularly through some of the certifying agencies over there that were doing it through equivalency agreements. And following those closures, we've kind of seen you know, the emergence of other Black Sea markets as the primary source of these imports. So, you know, the question is, you know, how much of this is due to the fact of increased transparency in terms of where they're coming from, or this is switched and where it's being sourced from, or, you know, what, what uh, you know, undisclosed bundle of impacts has really led to Russia emerging as such a substantial supplier of organic soybeans this year. Now, in terms of what that means for increased uh, clarity and in increased regulations from the NOP, you know, as we talked about last month, the NOP and the USDA in general are in the process of uh, pushing forth an expansion in terms of their ability to regulate and monitor organic imports and, and the packaging of organic uh, commodities within the U.S. One of those things being requiring, you know, import certifications for organic, specific organic import certifications that have a heightened level of detail. And in addition to that, increased information recording about the actual operations that are certified organic uh, overseas so that we, the USDA is able to do mass balance calculations and understand just what that supply picture looks like so they can better understand what imports should be looking like. With all of that said, what does that mean for the trend for Russia going into this next year? Boy, that's the million dollar question, you know. Uh, if we see this momentum like this continue and, and carry into this next mo marketing year, you know, you could see Russia emerge as the largest supplier of organic soybeans to the U.S. within basically the span of a marketing year, going from a marginal factor to the largest. I mean, they went from a marginal factor to the second largest just this year. Flip side of that being, you know, if if this does, the enhanced uh, certification protocols and enhanced regulations do lead to a re further reduction in imports from the Black Sea region, which we have seen in general, then perhaps not. Um, but this is definitely one of those factors that, you know, watching the supply balance in the U.S. and watching the fact that they're coming in back in prices, we're definitely going to be keeping a very close eye on as we move to this next market again. So wrapping up with an outlook of prices over this past month, uh, for the two-week period ending August 15th, the Macar's Market Price Survey recorded the U.S. delivered organic feed corn price at about 8.82 per bushel, up about 90 cents per bushel from the middle part of July. And really, what we're seeing here is a continuation of that strength that we saw building last month. I think as we're hitting the end of this marketing year, and we're coming out of it period now, but essentially for the past two months, the pace of organic corn imports has slowed. I think prices are starting to reflect a market that's beginning to tighten and beginning to leave that long position that's kind of been a wet blanket over prices essentially since last harvest. Following corn, organic feed wheat prices in the U.S. also saw some increase over the past month. Uh, the month of July ended at about $9 per bushel delivered for U.S. organic feed grade wheat, uh, and that's up about a buck twenty-eight from the start of the month. So, again, following that pricing trends set by corn of uh, higher prices. And then looking at soybeans, uh, we saw soybeans over the two-week period ending August 15th average about $20 per bushel, which is up about $0.75 cents per bushel from the midpoint of July. But if you kind of look at where soybeans have ranged essentially since uh, last December, this essentially this whole calendar year, we've seen soybeans bounce back and forth between 19 and $21 per bushel. So where we're seeing prices now is pretty much in line with where they've been coasting since, uh, really since we got through last year's harvest. So with the organic corn uh, swinging back the other way over the last couple of months, in this report uh, we've heard about weather impacting the corn crop here in the U.S. and then meanwhile we're seeing elevated uh, imported numbers, imported corn numbers. Uh, so are those two balancing each other out and what's your outlook as we start thinking about harvest time coming up here soon? Yeah, so you know I kind of harkening back to what we saw last year to be completely honest. One of the things that we saw last year and we all felt was the impact of weather. We had a, an exceptionally challenging planting season, and then even the growing season wasn't great for a lot of folks, and then harvest was a, a huge challenge. And with all of that, there was expectation going into last year's harvest that you would see an organic corn market in the U.S. tighten up uh, due to 
production issues. And the reality was quite the opposite. Uh, what we had was an unexpected growth in the industry. And, and the growth is always a, a great thing when you're talking about organics, even though it can lead to lower prices. But we just saw a lot more organic farmers, or organic, people transitioned to organic production, a huge increase in the number of organic farmers that added a lot more supply than we thought we were going to see uh, when we were looking at whether an acre is ahead of harvest. And that put us in this long position that I was talking about before that's just kind of depressed prices really since last harvest. Now, if we look at what we're looking at for acres and what we're looking at for yield and what we're looking at for U.S. supply right now, overall, acres look like they're going to be up a little bit, not a huge amount, uh, but a little bit. So far, looking at the number of certified organic operations, new certified organic operations really in the U.S., we're looking at some growth but not anything that looks like it's going to match last year's growth. Uh, and then looking at the yield side, you know, we've got some places that look like they're having challenges. You know, we talked about Ohio. We talked about Pennsylvania. There's a potential for uh, Iowa to have some challenges. But you get outside of that, large portions of the U.S. are going to have great crops. So it, it, it really is that supply picture, you know. If we do see the situation like we saw last year, in which industry growth was much stronger than we had anticipated going into harvest, and we see great yields, which I think for a lot of folks are going to see pretty good yields, then we could see a really strong U.S. domestic supply position. And with that, we could see lower prices, kind of regardless of what goes on with imports. On the flip side, you know, if it does look like it does now, and industry growth is not quite as robust as what we saw last year, and we do see these production issues tighten up supply just a little bit, you know, even if not, you know, pushing yields lower than where they were last year, but just not as high as they may have been otherwise, that could help add a little bit of support. And then we start to really kind of worry about what that import picture looks like. If we'll see, you know, imports from Argentina continue to escalate, if uh, cracked corn imports from uh, Turkey will kick back up and really start to come into the market. And so then there's the risk of some lower prices there. But really, you know, I think right now what we're going to be watching as we get ready to get into harvest is, you know, just how many new organic farms do we have this year? And, you know, just how good are yields in these, these great producing areas? And just how much damage have we seen in areas like uh, Iowa and Pennsylvania? So uh, it's, it's a little too call, early to call the game on what harvest prices are going to look like. I think there's room for them to kind of go either direction. But, uh, you know, to leave it on a cliffhanger, it's something that we're going to be acutely watching as we get into harvest. Definitely. And like you said, uh, a lot of this is uh, um, looking at last year. Sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we get it a little wrong. But certainly something that next month uh, that we'll be coming back with uh, more updated numbers and a better view of how things are looking uh, as farmers start thinking about harvesting crops. And really appreciate you taking the time today, Ryan. And we'll be back next month. Uh, and have a report then. Absolutely. Pleasure talking to you, Brian. Thank you.